chapter 4, we're going to start there. Luke 4, beginning in verse 5, this is the temptation of Jesus, the devil taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said unto him, all this power, this is the Greek word exousia, um, it means authority or jurisdiction, all this authority, all this jurisdiction will I give you and the glory of them, for that is delivered to me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Well, I mean, most Christians don't have a clue. They just think God's in control of everything down here. I mean, the insurance companies, if there's a hurricane or a flood or a disaster, well, that was an act of God. God didn't have anything to do with that. God originally created mankind. Genesis chapter 1 gave him authority and dominion over all the earth. Adam committed treason against God, rebelled, and sinned. When he did, he brought in a new law and a new ruler into the earth. The law of sin and death began to reign and rule. That's why the scripture calls Satan the God of this world. It says he blinds the minds of men to keep them from the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So there is another ruler that for a temporary period of time, most Bible scholars believe about 6,000 years from the time of Adam till this Adam's lease or mankind's dominion runs out, then we'll go into the 7,000th which is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We're closing in on that. Jesus is coming soon. So, but for the time being, we have an enemy that's down here. He has been defeated by Jesus Christ at his resurrection. Colossians 2.15 says that he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So if you really study that phrase out, he stripped, he defeated, he spoiled, dethroned, Satan from his position of governorship over the earth, but he still is here. He is not incarcerated. He still works and maneuvers and operates in the kingdom and power of darkness. But the good news is God had a plan to deliver those that would choose him and his way to get us out from under this domain or dominion of darkness that causes all the chaos and sickness and disease and tragedy and hatred and strife and war, <clears throat> all of this conflict that's in the world. Colossians 1, beginning in verse 13, it says that this way, talking about God the Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and the dominion of darkness. Well, there must be a dominion or a domain of darkness or you couldn't be delivered from it. I said there must be or you couldn't be delivered from it. But he has delivered us and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love. When you accept Christ, you come into another kingdom. I'm in another dominion. I'm under another domain. I have another Lord. Jesus is my Lord. He's the Lord, but I've made him my Lord. There is salvation in no other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Are you here? There's one name that's above every name. There's one kingdom that will rule forever. You can study the Old Testament prophets from Daniel and you find out, especially Daniel was written and we'll talk a little bit about that. It's the Old Testament counterpart of, of Revelation in the New Testament. He says there is a kingdom coming that will compass the entire world Amen. and it will never end. So we're on the cutting edge of that soon. This day will come. But right now we have to deal with evil spirits that are here darkness that is here because Satan has been dethroned but not incarcerated. And he will try to dominate your life. He tries. He looks for people that will yield to him. He wants to put them in politics. He wants to promote them over nations. He wants to cause wealth to come into their possession. He wants them to have great businesses and influence so he can hinder and stop the kingdom of God and Christianity and everything right, noble, and good. Are you here? So he's looking for people that'll yield to him. God, on the other hand, is looking for people that'll yield to him. Will you yield to God? Amen. Will you submit to God? The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil. So, so you have a choice. At least you have a choice in the matter. You can submit to God, make Jesus your Lord, or you can go on in darkness, and someday that darkness will consume you and take you into its eternal abode. But thank God we've been delivered if we've accepted Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen from you? So we've been looking at this. This is the fifth part of our series, so it would help you if you haven't been here, haven't heard it, go back, listen to this. It'll really help lay it out for you and help you a lot. So today I'm going to just talk about three what I call Bible facts 
about your life and how it's going to be impacted by, by authority or how it should be. Number one is this, a victorious life requires us to exercise spiritual authority. It requires it. You say, well, I haven't done that in my life. I know, but you don't have the victory that you could have. You haven't, you haven't hit your apex. None of us have. I haven't. I'm still growing. I'm still learning, and so are you. Are you here? But if you don't understand your spiritual authority and how to take full advantage of it, you're going to be ripped off in your life. Are you here? You have to learn how to exercise the spiritual authority that's been delegated to you through the name of Jesus Christ as a member of the body of Christ. You have the authority and you have the responsibility. And if you don't take it, uh, you're not going to get where God wants you to go. You're not going to make what God wants you to have. Life is not just physical. It's not just natural. It's not just mental. It's not just good luck and bad luck. There's no such thing as luck. Well, they just, they just are lucky. No, there's a kingdom of darkness. There's a kingdom of light. There are spiritual laws that govern and guide the universe. If, we've, if we learn how to operate and flow with God's spiritual laws, then it will take you to a higher plane, a higher plane of living, more peace, more joy, more blessing. Are you here? But you have to learn to operate in these spiritual laws. So one of them is that we have authority and we have responsibility on this earth. So we looked at this. We're going to look at it again. Ephesians 6 said life is, there are spiritual laws, there are spiritual forces that are working with us and for us and sometimes against us. So in Ephesians 6, notice what it says. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. So you must be able to. Well, I just can't help it, Pastor. I'm just so weak. He said, be strong in the Lord. He didn't say you had to be strong in yourself. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Or this is amplified. Be empowered with your union through, with him. Draw your strength from him. That strength which his boundless might provides. Put on God's whole armor. Armor, what is it? Well, if you read through there, it's attitudes. It's spiritual revelation, understanding that you've got to have. That's what the armor is. It causes there to be a force field around you when you understand the breastplate of righteousness, when you understand truth and you walk in the truth, when you understand what is provided in salvation, the helmet, when you understand what the sword of the Spirit is, that that's the Word of God. He said, you put this on. These are attitudes. It's revelation. It's understanding you have to have to be able to stand against the wiles and the schemes and all the garbage that's going on in the world. Are you here? Put on God's whole armor, <clears throat> the armor of a heavily armed soldier, which God supplies that you may be able to successfully. Everybody say successfully. God's not in the losing business. God's never been in that business and he never will be. His kingdom always succeeds. It always works if we work it. That you may be able to successfully stand against, up against all the strategies and deceits of the devil. Notice verse 12, for we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms, against the powers, the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. So there are other forces. It's not just the natural things that you see. There's a heavenly sphere. There's angels there. How many of you believe in angels? If you don't, you're a goofball. There are angels. The Bible says there are angels. There are also bad angels or evil spirits that fell and have been corrupted. There's demon spirits and they operate and they work over nations and influence regions of the world. And so it's not just flesh and blood we have to deal with. We have to deal with these evil spirits that are out there. The good news is that we can because we have authority. Notice over here in Daniel chapter 2, this is interesting. I mean Daniel 9, I said Daniel 2. Daniel chapter 9, uh, about 30 years ago I started studying Daniel 9 and Daniel chapter 10, like I said, it's the, it's the Old Testament counterpart of the New Testament book of Revelation. And Daniel chapter 9 is absolutely incredible because in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was studying the book of Jeremiah. And he understood about the time of Israel's captivity and it coming to an end. 
And he, he thought that he had that nailed down. And so he was praying about it, said, God, it looks like that the time should be up. What's, what's going on? So Daniel started praying. And in Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 2, <clears throat> says it this way. In the first year of his reign, Daniel understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations <clears throat> of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. So he started into this prayer. If you read the whole prayer, I don't know how long it would take you, probably three, four minutes to read the prayer. So he's praying about this. He said, Lord, it looked to me like, here's what I think. Uh, in the book of Jeremiah, he said it'd be 70 years. It looks like time's up. So he starts fasting, praying about all of this stuff. And then something remarkable happens. While he's praying at the end of his prayer, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, this is the same angel that appeared to Mary. Are you here? Appeared to Joseph in a dream. This is the same angel, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening uh, offering or sacrifice. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I'm now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy prayer, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So this angel appears. He said, I, From the beginning of the supplication, or the beginning when you started praying, the commandment came forth, and I am come. So from the so minute he started praying, God sent the answer. If you read it, he showed up at the end of the prayer, maybe three or four minutes, boom, there's the answer. No problem. There's the answer, three or four minutes. So that was good. It was an amazing answer. God gave him revelation about the end times. And basically he said, uh, he broke it up into three divisions. He says it's going to be 49 years in building Jerusalem for Jerusalem to be rebuilt. Then there's going to be 434 years after that. 434 years will take place. And then Messiah is going to die for the sins of the people. And that's exactly the time frame that happened. So the Messiah died, just like he said, 434 years later. And he said there's going to be, he said these were not just 70 years. They were 70 weeks of years or 490 years. Seven times 70, 490 years. And it's divided up in three parts. So he said you're going to have these 483 years that are going to take place. Then there's going to be a pause button. It's going to be halftime. The time of the Gentiles is going to happen. And then there's going to be one seven-year period left, which he called the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's going to be a seven-year closing out period of this age, which he said is going to call, it's going to be like the world has never seen. We commonly call it the tribulation period. And that's the revelation that Daniel got. Amazing revelation. He went on to talk about this. He had great revelation from God. So it didn't take very long from the time he prayed till the answer came. The next chapter, this same guy, that's why it's important, same guy, Daniel chapter 10, prayed again. He wanted to know more further revelation. And he says, in those days, I, Daniel was mourning for three full weeks. How many, how many days is three weeks? It's 21 days. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh or wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the 420th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, he said, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Euphaz, his body was like the barrel in his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and his feet like color to polish brass, and the voice of his words was like the voice of a multitude. So he has a supernatural uh, visitation. He sees this supernatural being, which was an angel, and so, but it's been 21 days. Notice what happened. 21 days, then there's an explanation of what happened. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. From what day? First day. And I am come for thy words. Well, I mean, he just prayed just a few verses back, and it was just three or four minutes, and he said, from the minute you started praying, I came. And here the answer was about four minutes. Then here in Daniel chapter 10, the angel says the same thing. 
He said, I started praying from the very first day you started praying, the commandment came forth. Well, what happened? Well, he tells us what happened. He said, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is an angelic entity. In fact, modern translations say the, uh, let me get it right here. Modern translations say the celestial prince, that's amplified. Uh, the Message Bible and others use the word the angel prince, the angel prince of the kingdom of Persia. Persia's modern day Iran, Iran's been screwed up for many, many, many decades, many, many hundreds of years. There's been a spiritual entity over Iran. And he said, the prince, the angel prince of the kingdom of Persia or Iran withstood me or stood against me for 21 days. But lo, Michael or the angel prince, Michael, if you're a Bible student, you know who Michael is. He's one of the archangels. The King James Bible calls him one of the chief princes, one of the most powerful and important angels. It says he came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So he said he got supernatural help and he said, now I'm come to make you understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days for the vision is yet for many days. And so he had tremendous revelation. Well, I mean, what's going on here? If you don't understand that there can be opposition, God answered both prayers on what day? First day. Everybody say first day. God sent the answer on the first day. Now, we have some incredible theology that is wrong, and we just sort of get the idea if God answers prayer, boom, it just happens instantly. That's not true. That's not true. Just because God answers your prayer and he sends it, it don't mean you receive it that day. There could be opposition. There could be that God sent the answer and the answer's on the way, but something or someone or some spiritual force is withholding and fighting to keep the answer so you will get up and you'll, so you'll give up and never get it. And so most Christians, because they're so mixed up in what they think, they got religion all mixed up in their believing, then they think, well, if God does it, it's just done. I prayed about it, but it's been two weeks. I guess it wasn't the will of God. Give me a massive break. You know the will of God. The will of God is the Word of God. If it's in the Word of God, it's the will of God. Amen. And if you pray, that's why in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive it and you shall have it. There's a, there's a period of time that takes place. Sometimes it's not very long. Sometimes you can pray. Say, well, how come sometimes it, it's a short period of time? Sometimes, how come it takes sometimes weeks? Sometimes it might take months. Sometimes it might take years. How come? Well, it's because there's different variables in this. Could be that there's, there's opposition from the enemy against you to keep you from receiving your healing. Could be there's opposition from, you, maybe you're the problem. You ever thought about that? You've been the problem about a lot of other stuff. Maybe you're the problem about that. Maybe you got a bad attitude. Maybe you got unforgiveness in your heart. Maybe you're in disobedience. Maybe there's some way the devil's using you to hinder the answer. Maybe you're not obeying God's laws of sowing and reaping and you're praying for financial breakthrough. There's spiritual laws that govern everything. So sometimes when the answer doesn't come, you don't go to God and say, God, you must be the problem. I prayed, I guess you didn't send it. I never pray that. If something is delayed, I'll say, God showed me what the, what's the incident here. And I, I'm filled with the Spirit, so I will pray in the Spirit. God, show me. Give me revelation. What's going on? Help me to know what to do. If I think that it may be an evil spirit hindering, then I'll say, Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I command you to cease and desist in your operations against me or against this, whatever it is, and I'll pray that way. Now, Daniel couldn't do anything about it. You know why? Because in the Old Testament, if you've been studying this, you found out they don't have any authority over the devil. The devil's not even mentioned much in the Old Testament. Just a few times and almost all of it in one book of the Bible, Job. How come he didn't tell them about the devil? Because they couldn't have done nothing about it anyway. But what if, what if Daniel just gave up in two weeks and said, I prayed about it. Forget this, man. I hadn't been eating in two weeks. I guess God didn't send the answer. I'm on a stake. 
I'm just going to give that deal up. Well, guess what? He never got the answer. You got to keep the switch of faith turned on. And sometimes there's opposition. In fact, many times there's opposition to what you're praying about, the breakthrough, the sale of your house, the new property you're believing for, the new job, the new business, healing, whatever it may be, there could be opposition. And so that's why you need to learn to pray in the Spirit. You need to be filled with the Spirit so you can pray in the Spirit because the Spirit will come to your aid and help you to pray the perfect will of God. That's one of his ministries. He makes intercession for us according to and in harmony with God's will. So you can pray the will of God. You need to learn to use your authority when things are not moving. God, what's the problem here? I'm praying about it. Show me why in the world. I know you sent the answer. God is never the problem. Your job is to believe you receive it and that God is faithful. God is faithful. And he will keep his word. He cannot lie. It's not a question of any. He cannot lie. And if he said it by God, he'll make it good. He'll keep his word. And you can just say, that's the way it is if God said it. I prayed in the name of Jesus. I know this is scriptural. It's in the word of God. And you stand your ground. And you pray in the spirit. If you're filled with the spirit, you use your authority. And the answer will come. God sends it when you pray. Your job is to believe he answered, he gave it to you, and stand your ground. Can I get an amen? And you can see that here. Instead of the theology that most people have, well, if, if God does it, I mean, it just instantly happens. Boom. No, it doesn't. You got a perfect Bible example right here. God said on the first day you prayed, I sinned. But one minute, I mean, one prayer is three or four minutes, the other prayer is 21 days. So you got to learn to use your authority and to stand in faith. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Um, second thing is we have authority because we're the body of Christ. I, I know that we don't really sometimes get a grasp on this, but we're really the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now are you the body of Christ and members in particular? Well, I mean... The church universal has had the idea with Jesus Christ. He has all authority and all power, true. He is absolutely astounding and amazing. He has all authority, he has all power. He can do anything. And he's been exalted. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father and all that's true. But what we have failed to understand is legally, if you're a member of the body, the body is seated with the head. I mean, your, your head goes with your body, doesn't it? If I ever see you and you don't have your head, guess what? Your body's not going to be there either. If your head's gone, your body's going to be buried somewhere. He said, you're the body of Christ. And the head and the body were raised together. Oh, you didn't deserve it. But you were given authority because you're a member of the body of Christ. Um... Authority can be delegated. You already know that. Luke chapter 9. And we, I didn't give it to you guys. Luke 9 says he called his 12 disciples together, gave them power and authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and disease. Then in Luke chapter 10, he called another 70 and he gave them power and authority. They returned in verse 17 and said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in your name. So he delegated his authority to others. Then finally, after he was resurrected from the dead, he delegated his authority to the church. He said, you go. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth now has been given to me. Now you go. And he gave authority to the church as a member of the body of Christ. That's what the Ephesians prayer was all about. Ephesians chapter one, the apostle Paul, he's praying for us believers because he said, you got to get some revelation. You got to get some revelation, something that is revealed to you, to your spirit by the spirit of God. You got to get it beyond mental into revelation. I mean, when you get a revelation, it changes everything. So that's what he prays for. In Ephesians 1, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto us a spirit of wisdom and revelation 
in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened so we'll know the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Where is his inheritance? In the saints. And what is, verse 19, the exceeding greatness of his power to who? Are y'all here or did you go to sleep? Are the lights too dim for you? Can y'all bring out coffee? His inheritance to the saints, his power to who? Us. What kind of power? Exceeding greatness. Okay, read the Amplified Bible. It says, immeasurable, unlimited power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he demonstrated in Christ when he raised him from the dead and he set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. How many of you believe Christ was raised from the dead? How many of you believe he's been seated at the Father's right hand in heavenly places? How many of you believe he's far above? What does it say, verse 21? Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the world to come. Are you here? Well, the church universal, at least the ones that are really born again, really a church, they understand Jesus is far above all principality and power. They understand his name's above every name. But you know what they fail to understand? Just a few verses down in verse 4, Ephesians 2, 4, it says, But God who's rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loves us. How many of you know God loves you? Amen. Guess what he did? Even when we were dead in our sins, he quickened us. It means he made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Verse 6, And hath raised us up together and made us sit where? What? Made us sit together. Where is Jesus? If you're seated with him, where are you? That means in authority. Yo, you're down here physically, but in authority, you've been raised up and seated with him in heavenly places. You're his body. He's not on earth right now, except through the body. His spirit is here, and his spirit operates through the body. And the authority on the earth has to be carried out through the body, and God ain't going to be doing anything about the devil until the end of... Uh, this age comes and the angels are going to come, put chains on the devil, throw him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And we go into the millennial reign of Christ. Everything that's going to be done about the devil on earth has been done until that time. And he gave authority to us. We've been raised up together, made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ in authority. And so God is wanting you to operate as an ambassador in his stead or in his place. There's nowhere, I mean, some of your Bible school students, okay, in the, in the, in the New Testament, any time any writer ever mentioned the devil in the New Testament, there's not one place in the New Testament where the writer said, pray to God to do something about the devil for you. Not one place. Not one writer said, you know what? If you see that you're under a spiritual attack and the devil's attacking you, just get down and pray to the Father and say, Father, help me. Father, do something about the devil and God will faithfully answer. You know there's not one place like that in the New Testament? Do you know that every writer that mentioned the devil and talked about the church, every single one of them said that you, the church, you've got to do something about the devil. He told you to do it. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, and he especially devours stupid Christians. Ignorant. Don't know. Only thing I ever heard in church was, you know, in the sweet by and by, hallelujah, it'll all be better and we'll all understand it then. Right now, just hang on and hold out and hope you can be faithful to Jesus returns. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. 
No, he, he roams about seeking whom he may devour. But notice what the Bible says in verse nine, whom resist? Well, he, it wouldn't do any good for you to resist the devil if you didn't have authority over him. If the devil could just do whatever he wanted to do and mess up your life and steal from you and rip you off and make you addicted to pornography and cocaine and drugs and marijuana and immorality, if he could just mess up your life with anger and there's nothing you could do about it, it wouldn't do any good for, for you to resist. But he said, whom resist? Steadfast in the faith. One translation says, with your faith, knowing that the same afflictions, tests, trials are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So Peter told you to resist under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then in Ephesians chapter four, here you see another reference. In Ephesians 4, 26 says, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Modern translations say, don't give the devil any opportunity. One translation says, don't give the devil a foothold. Well, I mean, if he can just take a foothold and there's nothing you can do about it, there's no use telling you to, to not give him a place. You can give him a place if you want to. You can let him dominate your life. You can let him dominate what you see, what you hear, where you go, all your feelings and emotions, all your behavior. You can give him a place if you want to. Or you can slam his head in the door. You can say, I will not allow you to dominate my life. I refuse to give you place in my life. I'm a child of God. Jesus is my Lord, not you. Amen. And then, of course, James 4, 7, we've been looking at that. What does James say? Submit to God. Have you done that part? Don't do any good. Do anything else if you're not going to do that. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And what will he do? What does flee mean? Run. One definition means to run from as in terror. Oh, he's not so afraid of you in the flesh. You're nothing. You can't deal with the devil in your flesh. But you know what? God dwells in you. Holy Spirit dwells in you. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. For greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So you can submit to God and you can resist. And God gave you the authority to do it and the responsibility because you're a member of the body of Christ. Amen. Last point is this. We exercise our authority in Jesus' name. Mark, Jesus told the same thing that these three other witnesses said. In Mark 16, verse 17, these signs will follow them that believe in my name shall they. How many of you in here are they? Amen. Who said would do it? They in my name are with my authority shall they cast out devils. He didn't say they'll pray and get me to do it. Did he? Are you all here this morning? No, he said in my name shall they. They'll do it. They'll exercise authority over demons. They'll do it in his name. You have a name. Really, in his name means in his stead, with his authority. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth was given to Jesus. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that he governs and guides and propels the universe with his word. Jesus does. All authority that Jesus has is invested in that name. Philippians says, God has highly exalted him, freely bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow, of things are beings in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That name's above every name, but he delegated that name to the church. You're his body. You're on the earth. He expects you to go in his name or in his stead. You remember 2 Corinthians 5, 20? Now we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is someone who's in another place representing another country. We have ambassadors from America that are in nations all over the world and they represent or speak for the government of America. 
Even the place where they live is considered American territory or domain. Is that right? We are ambassadors for who? Well, I, I didn't want to be an ambassador. I don't want nobody looking at me. Well, you are. We're ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, notice these three words, in Christ's stead. Everybody say, in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. He, he says, we're asking you in the place of Christ to be reconciled to God. When you go to work, you're going, you know what? In Christ's stead, if you're really his disciple, if you really belong to him, you're at work in Christ's stead. He's not down here on the earth. He's in heaven. He will come back, but he's not back yet. But you're here in Christ's stead. Stead means place. You're in Christ's place. When you go to school, you're in Christ's place. When you're, when you're at the mall, when you're at your hobby, when you're at sports events, you're in Christ's stead. So when you stand before people to pray and ask you for prayer, you're there in Christ's place. What would Christ do? How would he act? What would he say? Where would he go? You're in Christ's stead because you're a member of the body of Christ and the body of Christ here on earth. You're in Christ's stead. Are you here? Amen. So when I've had to deal with evil spirits, and there's not a whole lot of people in America that are real demonized. Every once in a while, somebody is. But I've had to deal with them. And I, you know, when they were really messed up, I'd lay hands on them. I'd say, I'm coming in the name of Jesus. And I'd talk to them. Now, are you, are you telling me that you're going to stay out of the kingdom of darkness and that you're shutting that off and you're going to serve Jesus and he's going to be your Lord? Is that right? Yes, help me. Yes. Okay. So I'd say in the name of Jesus, with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in his name, come out. Sometimes there's no, can't tell any difference other than there's peace or whatever. Sometimes then there's some kind of a foam coming out of their mouth and all kind of other stuff. But then in a minute, everything will be all right and they're chilled out. But we're here in Christ's stead. We're here in Christ's place. We take his place on earth. We do his will on earth in Christ's stead. Are you here? And we have authority and we have to use it. When the devil's jacking with you in your house, when he's jacking with your emotions and your feelings and all this stuff, you stand up and say, I have authority. The name of Jesus belongs to me. Amen. And you've got to use your authority or the devil will run roughshod over you. You know, years ago, oh man, I don't know, probably 30 years ago, the first time Veld and I heard a great minister, his name was Lester Sumrall, um, great father of the faith, he's went to heaven now, huge, he traveled all over the world, all these, I think 70 nations, went everywhere, just, and had to deal with evil spirits, demonic powers. Well, he ended up in the Manila, Philippines, this was 1953, something that happened. I heard him tell the story. We both heard him tell this story. They made a movie about it in 2019 and newspaper headlines all over the world carried this story because it was so crazy and they had photos of it and newspaper people were everywhere trying to see what in the world was going on. They never saw anything like it. And so it happened in Manila, Philippines and it was a story of a young girl. Her name was... Clarita, put, her, put, put the picture up here, Vela Nueva. And this is a book that he wrote, the true, true story of Clarita, Clarita Vela Nueva. And this girl was an orphan at 12 years old. She became a prostitute. Well, about age 17, the, the city authorities arrested her there in Manila. And they took her to this uh, prison there in Manila. And to say all hell broke loose is... I mean, there's no other way to say it. And she started screaming in the cell and just freaking out. And bite marks started appearing on her body. The guards went in to see what's going on. And uh, I mean, she's just thrashing and she's saying, get them off, get them off. All this is going on. And so they sent the prison <clears throat> doctor to 
try to see if there was anything they could diagnose or to help her. And she stopped and turned to the doctor and <laughs> cursed him and said, you shall die. He was dead in 24 hours. Another one of the guards that was in there, she did the same thing and cursed him and he died within 24 hours. And all these strange things started happening. So they, they took her out. They went to the mayor's office. He tried to talk to her and see what was going on. He thought, this can't be. And strange things started happening. It terrified the mayor. So the mayor got on the radio and sent out a plea over the city and said, if there's anybody in the city, we have a girl, we don't know what's happening. She's being attacked. We don't, we don't see anything. If there's anybody that knows how to help her, please come to the city. Please help us. And so this cry went out. They have photos about this. I mean, it was, you can, Wikipedia, Google it, you, you, all kind of stuff. And I'm not, I didn't see the movie, so I'm not telling anyone what's that. It may be real creepy. But anyway, so Lester Summerall was starting a church in Manila and he heard it on the radio and the Lord started dealing with him, said, go help her. And of course, if you, you probably never heard him, but very bold guy, just common sense. And he just told the Lord, said, I don't want to fool with that. I'm building a church. Let somebody else go help her. And he said, for three days, the Lord wouldn't let him alone. Finally said, okay. So on the third day, he goes up there. He says, I can help her. So he gets in the cell and I mean, all this starts happening. This, that she gets under attack again. These things are biting her. And I mean, so he ends it up, long story short, he cast demons out of that girl and she was totally set free. And newspaper talked about it, how she was set free. She ended up being normal, completely normal, got married, raised kids, married a rice farmer there. And uh, just tremendous. Well, the city was so grateful, the mayor told Lester Summerall, said, anything you want, you can have it. He said, I want to do a crusade right in the middle of the city, the city park. I want it all. I want you to have the lights. I want everything. I want to do a crusade. So he did a crusade. Thousands of people came to Christ. That church for, for years became one of the largest churches in the world. But it all came because somebody knew they were operating in Christ's stead. They knew they had authority in the name of Jesus. We have authority in Jesus' name, but we have to take advantage of it. Grace has provided you. Grace is what God has done for you before you were ever born. Grace provided salvation for you. It provided healing for you. It provided authority for you. It provided peace for you and blessing for you. God did that before you were ever born. Christ redeemed you from the curse of the law before you ever got on the planet. By grace. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace, put it up there, Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are you saved through what? That not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace has provided you everything you'll ever need. Some people get the idea that faith moves God. Boy, I tell you what, I'm going to exercise faith and I'm going to move God. You're not moving God. He don't move. Faith is your positive response to what grace has provided. Amen. If grace didn't provide it for you, you're not going to use faith and get it. But your faith is your response to what you find out in the Bible that grace provided. And you say, I believe that. I respond to that. Jesus died for me. Jesus resurrected. Grace provided him. Grace sent him. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. And I, but I respond. I believe. I have faith in what he did for me. Your response, your positive response is your faith. God's provided everything you ever need from the time you were born into this planet to the time you step off of it for a good life, for peace, for joy, for blessing. Grace provided it. But if you don't know, you can't have faith. That's why we got to go in the world. We got to preach the gospel. We got to tell people because at least then they got a shot. We tell them what grace provided and then they can say, yeah, I believe that. I respond to that. Or they can say, no, I don't care. I don't believe that. Well, grace provided you and I with authority 
salvation, peace, joy, blessing. It was all provided by the grace and mercy of God and we didn't earn one bit of it. But God gave it to us anyway. You know why? He loves you. He loves you and he wants good for you. He loves you more than you love your kids. He loves you more than anybody has ever loved you. He loves you more than any human could love you. He loves you perfectly. And he provided for you. And our response should be thank you. Oh God, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for the salvation you provided. Thank you for the blood sacrifice of Christ. Thank you that I have eternal life through him. Thank you that I have authority to use the name of Jesus. And you didn't leave me down here to let wicked spirits dominate me and imprison me and, and, and cause me trouble in my life. You gave me victory. Thank you. That's our response. By grace, through our faith. Can I get an amen from you? Thanks so much for watching. If this message blessed you, be sure to share it with your friends and family and hit subscribe. For more information, head over to our website or click the link below.